Lorenzo Combo Irvin, welcome to Tell a Friend. Thank you for having me. So, you know, let me start by simply asking you how you've been and, you know, how you've been keeping over these past few months. Well, like, like everybody else, I've been um, a little bit of suffering, a little bit of solace. I mean, you know, we're at a very um, interesting period of history, if I can call it interesting. And, um, you know, so I got sick, you know, because, of, you know, because of the usual things of the flu and the colds and so forth and so on and the change of temperature and all that. But um, I'm fortunate that I didn't get sick with COVID and die, you know, so from that standpoint, um, I, I feel, feel much better. I was saying I invited you uh, onto my show to talk about the re-release of your book, uh, Anarchism and the Black Revolution, which has now been re-released by Pluto Press. Now, for those who um, don't know, this book was actually originally released in 1979 as a pamphlet, which later turned into a book. And I wanted to firstly ask you, you know, how does it feel that your book, after all of these years, still resonates with audiences and is still being used to teach, you know, new generations of radical and new generation of anarchists? Well, I'm I'm humbled by um, knowing that the book has longevity and that it is an important, you know, to many people, it's an important uh, book, but um, I, I don't get, you know, overly confident or overly uh, excited over that, that fact. I use that as a means of um, explaining to myself that I need to do more, in fact. I need to write more. Um, you know, I've, I, I, that book is 42 years old. Uh, at least it started, it started uh, as a pamphlet 42 years old, uh, ago, as you uh, had pointed out. But um, the reason it is still uh, around with relevance is because I was trying to think in advance uh, rather than think, you know, in, in, in the uh, time frame I was in. I mean, the time frame I was in was important, but I wanted to think about something in, in, um, in the future, how what we say and do in this period influences the future that's what i wanted to be able to do and so from that standpoint i'm very proud of the book but i'm not you know crazy <laughs> uh ego maniac over it i mean i think it's an extremely important book but it's more important to others than it is even to me well i was wondering if you could uh you know talk to my audience about you know, what originally motivated you to write this book and also thinking about the conditions in which this book was born? Well, I was in prison actually, and um, I was serving two life sentences uh, for hijacking a plane uh, to Cuba. And um, I was a, uh, you know, a revolutionary uh, back in the 1960s, you know, there was nothing special about me though. I mean, uh, that was a revolutionary period. And, uh, but I'd gotten to the stage uh, by 1969 uh, that um, I was losing my faith in all the uh, movements that had existed as well as losing my faith in uh, status communism or the ideas of, of state, uh, you know, state-based uh, movements whether they were communists or, or non-communists for that matter. And uh, so, I, and, and, and the black struggle had waned considerably by that time. And um, I had come to the point that um, I met Martin Sostry. It was, it was the talk with Martin Sostry, who was the best known political prisoner in the world at that time. He was a black Puerto Rican and uh, in New York state. And I had met him, they brought me back to the New York city and put me in the federal house of detention. So we used to talk, we used to talk, um, on a long-term basis, actually, while I was there, talked every day. Um, uh, as long as we could be together, I would, you know, talk to him, and he would explain to me what anarchism was, and uh, you know, gave me ideas on how I should deal with my case. He was concerned about the fact that back in those days, hijacking a plane uh, was a capital crime. You know, you could have been sentenced to death, and he was very concerned about that. And the, and the fact that the case was in Georgia, 
uh, you know, where there'd be an all white jury and I could be sentenced to death very easily. Um, so he was concerned about these things. So we talked about this stuff all the time. And so he brought my understanding and, you know, and radicalized my thinking. Um, so that by the time, you know, years later, after I'd been in prison for some years, I'd gone through uh, an extensive level of political education. It was self taught political education, but nevertheless, it was political education. And I understood uh, the ideas of, of radicalism generally, as well as the particulars of, of anarchism, you know. And um, it wasn't immediately that I, I got the ideas of, of, you know, building an anarchist, a black anarchist federation. Uh, that was years later. In fact, it didn't happen until I got out. But the, the, the idea that there has to be an alternative to what existed at, at the end of the 1960s, when the movement was falling apart and, uh, you know, people were looking for alternatives. And for me, that alternative for me was anarchism. And not so much the um, groups that existed as much as the ideas and the radical history. Uh, that, was, that was important, you know, and, uh, so it was years later that I actually wrote Anarchism Black uh, Revolution, 10 years after I'd been in prison, in fact. I'd done extensive thinking about it, you know, and, and so when I wrote it, it was written from the standpoint that the anarchist movement at that time was just a white movement. And um, it, it didn't speak to Black people. And so I wrote a book uh, that raised the contradiction of a, of a movement that says it was a revolutionary movement, not dealing with the condition of oppressed uh, blacks and other peoples of color, colonized peoples, you know, whether it was internal colonies in the United States and other countries, as well as on the continent of Africa. And uh, so I was raising these contradictions in a way that um, extended the thinking in terms of anarchism to deal with black and other peoples of color. So that was a, a first in and of itself that hadn't happened before. People try to act like uh, you know, anarchism was some group that had the diversity or something. I don't know. It, it was not the fact. And in fact, I had a great deal of opposition from uh, white anarchists uh, by my raising this issue and then calling upon uh, more black people to join the anarchist movement so that we can help to change it or help to build on a, an internal alternative, you know. And that's what I've been doing all this time ever since, you know, I wrote it, the original anarchism in the black revolution. It's becoming, it's become more and more of a rallying uh, cry for black activists, more than just uh, trying to explain it to white anarchists why they should uh, be forthcoming and open, you know, and, and, uh, and open support for the movement, which they never have done. They've never been uh, sympathetic to the idea of a black anarchist movement. And so we had to fight our way in to whatever we were able to do, you know, whatever uh, formations we were able to build and all that we were able to do, we had to fight it. So the book uh, was the battering ram, if you will, to deal with internal, um, what I call internal racism inside the movement and this, this um, whole uh, effort to prevent the rise of a black uh, anarchist movement, which is going to come, it's coming more and more. And of course, I was one of the ones who created the first uh, Black Anarchist Federation in 1994 in Atlanta, Georgia. So anarchism in the Black Revolution was just a step. It was the ideological foundation and framework for what came afterwards, which was the Federation, Black Autonomy Federation. And, and, and I think for me, um, you know, obviously reading it and reading up about yourself, I was surprised, uh, well, not surprised to be honest, but you know, just astounded by um, you know the way that you've mentioned how there was so much opposition to you writing this. Obviously, whilst being incarcerated, and you know, you spoke about how you had to write multiple editions, uh, you know, to kind of keep it you know secret and then eventually get it published. And you know, that must have taken you know some doing uh, from your part. And also, I will say, you know, as someone who went into the book, not knowing anything about the movement, not knowing anything about the, you know, ideology, what it stood for, um, you write in such a way that's so accessible to people. And uh, I think, you know, that's something that, you know, I'd praise you for. And, um, you know, it's, it's one of the books that I was able to actually digest and understand everything and how open you were 
um, when you were talking about it, you know, talking about your experiences, but also, you know, merging in, you know, the realities of the ideology. And if I build upon that, I wanted to pull apart a quote here when you were talking about anarchism. You write, social revolution is wholly different from a political revolution. In the former, the issue is to put the people in command, whilst in the latter, the leadership commands the people. And I wanted to pick that point um, to basically ask you about the power and the importance of the grassroots. And if we think about you know, the movements of today, if we think about the struggles that we go through today, why do you think the grassroots is so often sidelined in favor of this vanguard approach with, you know, a leadership, you know, flocking the people? Well, it, it really is a question of power. Uh, the movements in the past, even the revolutionary movements in the past have been made basically uh, built in terms of creating power for the leadership as opposed to power for the masses of people themselves. Now they give lip service to it, but in the actual practice, the historical practice, you can look and see that who got power and who got what, uh, the, the, the people got the prisons, the people got into prisons, if you look at Russia as an example, and uh, the, the leadership got the power. Stalin got power, dictatorial power, Lenin and Stalin got dictatorial power. And if you look at revolutions that have taken place since that time, it's always been about the leadership. But we are fighting, we, as an anarchist, I understood early on that we have to fight in terms of putting power in the hands of the people and putting power in the hands of those who can administer. You know, we're not trying to administer the state and take over power. We're trying to put power in the hands of the people. We're trying to organize the people to be a base of power. To, so that the, the really the organization is the people. That's the only source that can make revolution. It isn't so-called leaders, no matter how intelligent or articulate they are. It is, in fact, the masses of people who are dissatisfied with their lot and see the historical uh, moment. And they seize upon it and they crush the, those in power. They, they crush the, the rich rulers, the capitalists. That's how the revolution has to actually take place. We've seen for 70 years or more, we've seen the effect of authoritarian socialism. Uh, we've seen the effect of, in fact, uh, in, in the, another state, uh, state is form, uh, the so-called representative governments. We've seen the effect of that become fascist regimes or, or in fact, uh, continually beat down the masses of people. And, and you know, me being one of those, uh, having lived through that process. And so, I think that it helps us to understand. That's why I wrote it that way. It helps to understand in terms of what do these ideologies really mean? What do they result in? And have they empowered or, or, or freed anybody? You know, and, and have they freed the masses of people? And so if you look at it from that standpoint, I write from the perspective of the, the people on the bottom, the people of which I'm one of them, the people on the bottom, we're the force for revolution. We're the, we're the motive or motor force for revolution. You know, obviously, you know, when you say anarchism to people, you know, let's be real, people have all kinds of preconceptions or, you know, misrepresentations about what it stands for. You know, they think of violence, they think of chaos, you know, we, we all know this. But what I really like is, you know, right from the beginning of the book, you write, Let's look at the real world and see who's causing all of the violence. And then you go on to list, you know, the world wars, talk about Vietnam and, you know, what is done by the state. And then you put here, if we speak honestly, we must admit everyone believes in violence and practices it, however much they may condemn it in others. Either they do it themselves or they have the police or army to do it on their behalf. And I really wanted to pick up point uh, pick on that point and ask you, to what extent have these myths around anarchism prevailed? Or do you believe that, you know, you've been closer to actually getting people to wake up and understand what anarchism actually means? Well, you understand that over a long period of time, the governments of the world have utilized the small scale 
attacks by anarchists, uh, individual assassinations of a president uh, or of a uh, leader of industry, so-called captain of industry. And uh, they've seen those attacks with, the, with what's been, what was called uh, propaganda by the deed. And they denounce anarchism in such a way to denounce everybody, every person who's an adherent of the movement saying that they just believe in mindless violence. And it isn't just the capitalists that have done that or, or the rich. It is in fact, even ideological rivals like in Marxists and others have, have, you know, Leninists in particular have said the same thing and used that as a justification for stifling the entire movement uh, in, in Russia and other countries, Spain and other countries. They've used that uh, to claim, oh, well, the anarchists are just, un, you know, uh, automatically violent. Well, the, the reality is a very small portion of the anarchist movement at any historical moment has ever even engaged in violence. The great majority have not engaged in violence. They've engaged in, in massive protests of one sort or another, uh, you know, mass movements, uh, but they haven't engaged in, in, in so-called violence, uh, which the state, you, which the state especially the American government has used it for, for years to try to claim that uh, anarchism by itself, just in, its, in, in as an ideology, is an ideology of, <clears throat> I'm sorry, an ideology of chaos and of violence. And there's no proof for that whatsoever. In fact, the attempts that uh, anarchists have are made to organize in countries that were having revolutions or, or were having mass protests, it was the state that crushed them or, or the so-called um, uh, left uh, uh, you know, rivals of anarchists. But the main thing is that yes, it has been the state, which is the greatest purveyor of violence bar none. I mean, they, we can say the world wars, but even before the world wars, it's been incessant wars ever since the, the uh, creation of the state and of violence. There has been, uh, they, they've been the, the main ones waging war. Millions, millions and millions of people have been killed as a result of the various wars that have taken place, whether the colonial wars, where they took over, you know, um, countries in Africa, Asia, Latin America, or the, you know, the, the, the world wars or, or, or nation state wars of any sort, of, of which there are numerous ones, you know, and um, the reasoning for their uh, engaging in violence uh, is acceptable to some people inside of, of the, the country they're in because of fake patriotism, fake patriotism uh, that, uh, you know, even to this day, the idea that they could invade another country, whether it's Iran or Iraq or, or wherever, and, and uh, the, uh, a, a considerable segment of the population would support it. Well, the anarchists were the, one of the first groups that came out against World War I, and of course, many of them were put in prison. The anarchists and libertarian socialists were put in prison as a result of just um, coming out and speaking against the war, speaking that it was a rich man's war, poor people and working people had no stake in it and so forth. And many of them were put in prison for saying that because they came out with the so-called uh, Espionage Act uh, around that time, uh, which was in fact is being used to this very day. In fact, that's what they're trying to use to put uh, uh, people in prison right now, uh, activists all over, all over the world, not just in, in the United States, they're, they're actually using it to, to stifle journalists and others um, claiming that they're a threat to state security of the United States. Um, so yes, violence, you know, we can say that one, we can say that there, war, yeah, there are just wars. There are such a thing when they're in the hands of the people. I mean, it was a just war to overthrow slavery. Uh, but the reality was um, until the slaves themselves rose up and became part of the Union Army in the United States during the Civil War, there was no possibility of winning that war. The, the South would have won it. And, and, and the white government, the, 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 to be truthful, the white government has never kept its word to Black people in terms of w winning victories or winning, winning rights any more than they have against the Red Indians that they have killed off uh, many years ago. And they still, to this very day, deny them any real citizenship or any any uh, uh, rights under under the so-called uh, capitalist system. So, violence is a instrument, a useful instrument for those in power.
And, you know, I want, I want to build up on, you know, that quote that I previously stated. So, you know, where you're talking about, you know, either people do it themselves or they have the police and army do it on their behalf. You know, I wanted to talk about this uh, because it raises uh, an interesting question. So thinking of those who don't subscribe to anarchism, do you yourself um, see those people as being accessories to global oppression or do you actually have sympathy for their, you know, ignorance to the ideology? Well, you know, I'm, I'm one of these people that uh, believe that people have to be politically educated uh, and, uh, and understand that the state has the means, not only the uh, physical means for controlling people, but they have the control of the um, uh, communications and they have control of the schools and they have control of all of the instruments of social so of, of society. And they're able to use that to, to brainwash people on a broad scale. And uh, so I, I've always subscribed to the fact that what revolutionaries must do at certain stages, maybe the beginning stages, is they've got to educate people. They've got to not only just to organize them uh, in the streets, but they've got to educate them to break away from the uh, propaganda and the lies of the state. This is extremely important. And uh, it's important also to understand that we have got to continue to train organizers, educate the organizers. When I say educate, I'm, I don't mean this uh, conventional education, going to school. I mean, use just what, what I'm doing right now and what I did in terms of anarchism and the Black Revolution is to use the history, uh, the ideas and, and, and the, um, the, the, the long uh, experiences of struggle, use those things to educate the next generation, educate the broad masses of people so they can break away from the lies and the propaganda, because that's an important step. People are not just going to rebel. I'm not expecting anyone to rebel just because I want them to do it. It doesn't work like that. It has to be related to actual social and, and economic circumstances where people are raising up or rising up over the conditions of their oppression. Uh, but also it has to be under circumstances where they feel and know that they can win because who would want to risk your life if you know far already that you can't win or that you can't, you know, that your efforts are futile. And so the state wants you to believe just exactly that, that you can't fight, that people who raise contradictions, uh, revolutionary groups are crazy people and you should listen to them. But in, in their own minds, they, they're, they're fearful. They are scared to death because what is ultimately going to happen is um, all people want to be free, especially nations of people that are being oppressed and have historically been oppressed by the European powers. You know, they want to be free, uh, even though years and years and years have gone by um, and they still are not free. But the struggle, the fight, and even the so-called losing fight encourages them to continue to resist. And so, you know, like we said, the Black Panther Party didn't overthrow the American government or, or the, you know, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee didn't completely, you know, uh, change the South, you know, although it did make changes. Uh, they were not broad enough to change everything, you know, change the entire uh, structure and, and, and the social life and all that. They weren't able to do that, but they certainly made an impact that uh, caused people to have a deeper level of thinking. It's, it's amazing to what extent in the 1960s, uh, there was a, uh, a widespread belief and faith in the possibility of revolution in that period. Uh, it is nothing like it is now. I don't let anybody fool you that the, the current period is like it was in the 1960s. Not at all. Uh, there was broad-based uh, belief uh, by young people, and not only young people, because there were many other people who were older adults or whatever who supported these movements, who saw that, that these movements were changing uh, conditions of life for Black people, for instance, in the South and other parts of the country, changing conditions of life so that they didn't have to be debased and killed and, and suffer uh, the way they had been suffering historically for hundreds of years. So these struggles are extremely important. So my thing is, is to give ideas, give guidance, as long as I'm on this earth. And of course, the things I've written, hopefully they'll far last 
they'll last far beyond my, my uh, life on this planet. And uh, people will be able to pick up on them. And, and as you said, it's made plain. That's the whole thing. I write in a, in a way to make it plain. And uh, this was one of the things that back in the day with the Black Panther Party newspaper, it was so powerful because it wrote in a fashion that it made it plain what your level, what your oppression was, what you can do, how you can become part of a movement uh, worldwide with other, other uh, Black people and other oppressed peoples all over the world fighting against the same conditions and the same sorts of things you're fighting against. So it's extremely important. Now, you know, when we're talking about the Black Panther Party, you know, we have to talk about the fact that it was not just an American organization. Uh, there were, in fact, seven other countries that had Black Panther parties. And uh, <clears throat> this um, is extremely important to understand because it um, points out that we were looking at a uh, transnational movement. You know, and, and black power. Black power was a transnational movement. It ultimately became a transnational movement. A lot of people don't understand that it was, in fact, a youth-based movement, which was a transformation away from the civil rights movement. And I think, and I and, think we, I think we have to point out here. Uh, sorry to interject. You know, the credit to people like Stokely Carmichael. Um, you know, I have to keep saying his name because I know that, you know, a lot of people try and remove him from the history, but without people like Stokely Carmichael, it would not have become the transnational movement it became. Um, so yeah, I think that's a very good point that you make, but I'll let you go on. Stokely Carmichael and Willie Ricks. <laughs> and Willie Ricks as well, yes. Because Willie Ricks was his main man. Uh, but um, yeah, but but the point I'm making, I'm 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 going beyond just the leaders of the movement. Yes, there were people who were put forth as leaders and so forth, and and they and they made important uh, contributions. But the movement itself went beyond just leaders. There were uh, it, you know, this movement linked to, um, you know, other movements like in the UK. Uh, it linked to the um, the the um, Caribbean. Where the you know the anti-colonial forces there and, and anti-colonial forces in Africa, in fact, uh, even the um, the Black Consciousness Movement of South Africa was influenced by SNCC and the Black Power Movement. Um, so th these things were happening on a broad scale. The youth were fighting. It really was a youth-based revolution uh, in the in the late '60s. That's something to understand. 1968 was a period uh, almost like 1905 in, in Russia. There was broad-based struggle. Uh, there was a, a class resentment. There was, there was all kinds of movements arising. You know, one of the most important movements besides the Black Panther Party and, and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in the 1960s was um, a movement of, of uh, auto workers in, in Detroit. Uh, League, which became the League of Revolutionary Black Workers. That was an Im extremely important movement. And it was a re revolutionary syndicalist movement. Well, you know, they weren't being called that. They weren't calling themselves that. But that's what, if you look at it historically, that's exactly what they were. And of course, the white radicals have never wanted to give them credit for building that movement and for, you know, ch challenging the, the racist uh, uh, UAW, you know, United Auto Workers uh, uh, leadership who are corrupt and in, in, in bed with the, the government and with the, the companies. Um, and they never wanted to, uh, you know, give their real history of the work that they had done. And, um, but there was a large number of black workers in, in the automobile industry in the 1960s. And um, they were given the worst jobs in, in these plants in Detroit and, uh, and in other cities, it wasn't just Detroit. And, um, so the fight that started in Detroit ultimately became a nationwide movement. And um, workers in uh, New Jersey, workers in Atlanta, and in other cities where Blacks were employed in the automobile industry, um, started organizing a Black mass movement, a Black union movement. And of course, it was ultimately uh, defeated. But that's, that's another story in and of itself. But the point is, there were these movements in the 1960s that came out of the Black Power movement. 
And I always say, and some people disagree with me, and that's fine, that uh, for instance, the Black Panther Party and and you know the, these these people that were in in Schnecken and others, they were the radical wing of the Black Power movement. Nobody wants to talk in terms of that. They always want to talk in terms of of just uh, poetry and and you know this sort of thing and 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 the leaders. They that's that's a constant refrain, but it's a much deeper issue than this. Uh, and when I was writing, when, well, when I was uh, seeing this stuff, seeing it in the 1960s, um, this is when I understood that what I was looking at was a revolution, a developing revolution, if it had not been stopped, of course. That's what I was looking at, a social revolution. And um, it uh, had tremendous potential. Now, in the United States, because of racism, White people never took the, the movement serious. They never took it seriously, except as a threat. But um, you know, as far as a movement that could transform the condi social condition of Black people and transform the nation, the, the, the United States, um, they never really looked at it like that. Now, the curious thing is that in other countries, of course, the United Kingdom, but even in in Switzerland and Sweden and other countries uh, in Europe, as well as, as other parts of the world, you know, the black black world, they understood it at a far deeper level, at a far deeper level. They understood that this movement could be the one that would transform all of American society uh, forever. You know, it looked at it has, having that potential. Now, as I told someone, I, uh, <clears throat> revolutions come and go. and they don't always succeed. You know, there are some revolutions that had tremendous potential, uh, but they did not succeed. And they and, and because they didn't succeed, they are, you know, cast aside. People don't even want to talk about black power except in some kind of, you know, a way of, of, of a cultural thing, you know. Um, but no, politically, it had tremendous impact. There were revolutionaries all, there were people risking their lives to try to change the conditions of black people in America all over the country. They were calling them black militants back in the day. You know, they, they were just like, shooting people down and all this kind of thing. All the killings that are taking place now in black neighborhoods by racist police. Well, they were doing that then, but they were doing it with political activists. They were uh, targeting assassinations. But I, I think I think I think that point that you just made uh, is something that I want to pick on. You know, you just mentioned there about how black power, of course, thinking about the 60s and 70s, is now remembered as a cultural phenomenon rather than a political one. And you know, I completely agree with you. Uh, you know, we have all of these, you know, TV shows, and you know, we have all of these articles celebrating the Black Panther movement, global movement for its you know, publication of newspapers, okay? For its, you know, the poetry, the music, the, you know, iconography of black power. But we don't often talk about the politics that was involved in linking up the UK, you know, India, Australia. We don't talk about the politics that was involved, which was anti-capitalist at its core which was, you know, pro working class, we, we don't we don't talk about any of that. So I do. Yeah, I think that's a very important point that you put, uh, picked up there. Well, you know, to me, I had always uh, seen and understood that uh, as a um, important principle of analysis. Okay, so how can you analyze a movement? If you have taken it and you coattailed it, that's the term I use, have, that you have coattailed it into just a, a single space. And this is how you explain it. Um, this is a broad, it was a broad based movement and it was a, a rebellion of black youth on a number of different levels. Like I said, we talked about, um, when, I, when I visited the UK, for instance, and I think it was 20, uh, 13. And uh, one of the things I talked about, what, what I always talked about was 
the radical wing of the Black Power Movement, of which I situated the Black Panther Party. I situated the, the, the group I told you about, the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, uh, LROM, and all these other groups that were based in plants and automobile plants. Uh, even SNCC which continued for a while, they united with the Black Panther Party. In fact, they, the leadership of SNCC was, um, well, they used the term drafted by Huey P. Newton and, and, and other leaders of the Black Panther Party to become part of the up and coming Black Panther Party because they didn't have any lead, they didn't have any trainers and leaders in there that had you know, experience in dealing with organizing. You know, They didn't have those, so they, they had to bring them in. And this is, uh, the, the point where myself, I wasn't a key organizer, but I was an organizer, uh, became part of the Black Panther Party. And uh, I, I'm, I think uh, my understanding is something like that happened also in the UK. Uh, you know, you had all these different groups. They knew each other they, and so forth and so on. They had a, a basis of some respect and so forth. And as they were developing, um, you know, they realized that they had to unite on some level. And in the case of the, everybody denies it now, but there was a <clears throat> level of, uh, they, some call it a, a, an alliance, some call it a merger. I don't, I don't know what you want to call it. I, I, my, my belief is yeah. just, it happened. <laughs> it, it happened. Here in the UK, well, going off the uh, oral history interviews I've done, you know, they talk about how at the time, if there was a campaign going on that was in the you know black panther party uh, well black panther movement in the uk or the you know black liberation front or whichever group it was in the uk because there were so many black power groups they would all coalesce and they would come together and they would fight um even with the asian youth movements that were happening all across the north they would all come together and they would fight so yeah as you're saying, I feel some of the divisions that are made about the Black Power groups aren't so pronounced as people try and make. You know, back, back in the day, Black with a political color, you know, that's what they said in the UK. If you were Black, meaning if you were non-white, if you were part of the oppressed group, we're going to fight for you. Um, and I feel that nowadays you have people trying to create divisions where divisions weren't. Yeah, that's, a, that's an important assessment, Brian. Uh, uh, I think something like that happened in the United States as well. Uh, by, so by the late 1960s or, or sometime in the 1970s, you had uh, all kinds of divisions that took place uh, from, for instance, I, as I said, I, I was actually trained as an anarchist by Martin Sostry. Well, Martin Sostry was a, a Black Puerto Rican, you know, and, um, you know, some people try to look down on him now, or look down on that idea now, as somehow he wasn't Black enough or something or other, you know, so you got this kind of infantile uh, nationalism or, 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 or backward nationalism, uh, along with, you um, this kind of uh, policing, ideological policing, I call it. So that I've, I've been attacked for years uh, by that uh, because I call for anarchism. Uh, and um, people thought that I was under the control of some white folks or something because I was in the movement and I didn't have a voice myself. They didn't think I was that kind of person or whatever. They didn't know uh, anything about me or what I stood for. But um, we have to uh, look at this from the standpoint of the state destroyed these organizations. I mean, we made mistakes uh, of our own. And we might have walked into the line of fire or whatever. Uh, attacks were being made up on different uh, groups of black power groups. But it was the state that did it because the state saw them as a great danger. Uh, the state saw the alliance between the Black Panther Party and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee as a, as an extremely dangerous thing because SNCC already had a base in other parts of the country, a new, new revolutionary movement. It was seen to be extremely dangerous. They went to work at the first, the first Black COINTELPRO 
uh, <clears throat> used against the Black Panther Party was the one used against their alliance with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. So they had to destroy that. They had to create um, ideological and political and personal contradictions to destroy it. That, and, I, and I gather to some degree that's what happened with the UK. You had some, the, the government caused a great deal of the uh, problems. But I, I, I wanted to uh, refocus our conversation and move back onto a line that you, uh, you said in your book, where you said, I believe Blacks and other oppressed nationalities must have their own agenda, distinct worldview and organization of struggle. Now, with this in mind, I wanted to discuss political Blackness and I wanted to hear your stance on the doctrine itself and, you know, are you in opposition to political blackness? Or if not, where do you see political blackness working in you know, the struggles of today? Well, I'm sure that's a term that they use now, but it's it's not a term that hasn't it's, it's not a term that hasn't been used in the past. Uh, you know, back in the day, you had what there was a, a division. Let me just say this: there was an ideological division inside of the um, the black power movement between those who were cultural nationalists and who believed that uh, uh, if you were black, you were automatically uh, to be accepted and so forth. Even if you were in the CIA, some stupid people believe that. And there was big fights over that. And, uh, <clears throat> but, you know, th th one of the things that helped to defeat the ideology of, of, the, of the black power was that there was no clear definition of what black power was and there was no real uh, ability to ferret out enemy agents, at least at that stage, at the early stage, because people could say, well, I'm black too. I don't know why I can't, you know, or, or then they had this thing of a uh, black, um, blacker than thou. You had some of that kind of stuff going on. And uh, m most of this was cultural cultural nationalism, you know, like it's some black people that uh, didn't accept uh, Huey P. Newton or, or even Malcolm X because they were light skinned or, or whatever, you know, they, so you had that kind of stuff, you know, but that was not as pronounced as the idea that, um, you know, black people uh, should just, uh, we should be uniting but we're not uniting around anything of substance, you know, in, in reality. We'd be uniting around the idea that any black person should succeed. And that has been the, the case a long time. Now, I'm not sure what this political blackness is you're talking about. Um, I don't know how that differs anyway from, um, you know, the, I, you'll have to explain that to me. Yeah, well, the, the political blackness that I'm talking about is, um, you know, it, it, I'll, I'll talk for the UK context, which is what I know best. In the UK, in the 70s and 80s, um, Black people, and even, you know, to some extent, the 60s, people coalesced around this ideology of Blackness. So they really, like, took away that Black term and repurposed it to fit, you know, their political needs at that time. So a lot of people, if you speak to a lot of older people uh, from that era, you know, they'll say I'm black. They may not be physically black, but they say, you know, I'm black politically, you know, I'm, I'm not white and I don't stand for whiteness as an ideology. But today it's become quite a problematic term where you have a lot of people, especially my age, I, I'm one of the few people of my generation who actually subscribes to it, who, you know, a lot of people my age say it's, you know, it doesn't suit us and, or they talk about, you know, anti-Black racism within the Asian community. Um, but yeah, I just, yeah, I just wanted to know from you where you stand on that and where you see solidarity between oppressed communities versus oppressed communities having their own distinct identities. <clears throat> You know, okay, I got where you're coming from now. <clears throat> I think that, um, you know, I've always stood for the possibility of, you know, Blacks and peoples of color uh, being able to unite, unite on some level in terms, of, in terms of the political struggle. 
um, now, as far as identity, you know, black people have had their own history and it's important to maintain their own history and the historical perspective. Um, since we've been, we were the only people in America that are slaves, you know, that were slaves. I mean, other people were oppressed, including, like I said, the, the, uh, the native, uh, the natives, but, um, you know, black people have had a certain kind of oppression and it continues to this day, you know, massive imprisonment, for instance, uh, people being shot and killed in the streets. If, if something bad is going to happen, if the state is going to divvy out some kind of punishment or whatever, it's going to be against black people. So black people have got to have a perspective that um, protects us, you know, pr protects us from genocide, you know, and, and protects us from other types of, uh, of oppression. And we can work with other peoples. And, you know, it's debatable whether every <clears throat> Black organization does that. I, I uh, have been one that uh, thinks that it's possible to do it, but we can't give up our own grievances with this system. And we can't, uh, we have to be uh, autonomous in the sense that we are building our own movement. And that movement is, um, is what has to be representative of our, of our historical experience. Now, that does not mean that, as I said, we can't work with other movements, uh, work with other peoples, oppressed peoples, um, and people who were not oppressed, but, you know, but are in solidarity. We can work with them, but we work with them from the standpoint of our own needs and our own political understanding. And uh, we build our own movement to represent us, you know, and, and if, if people are gonna work with us, and who have uh, their oppressed as well, uh, and so forth. We'll f we can find a basis of unity. But the, but the, the point I would um, come back at you on is, you know, I hear what you're saying, and what you're saying, you know, is everything that I believe, but I think when you coalesce around political blackness as an ideology, and when you can get people to identify as one, you know, truly identify as one, not just, you know, oh, we have solidarity with another group, but truly identify as we are one. It's different. And I feel that after the 80s, in the UK especially, the state really was trying to draw apart everyone. You know, it was telling the Asian groups, you know, oh, you should be identifying with this group. It was, you know, and even within the Asian group, you know, if you're Muslim, if you're Hindu, you know, you should be, you know, prying for this, you know, funding that we've got, you know, we've got funding. Do you want funding for this? Do you want funding for that? And I feel that back in the 70s, when they were really going after the Black Power, you know, ideology, they were able to get everyone together and say that, no, you're not going to divide us. Um, so that's where I stand on it. Again, this isn't going to be solved today. So many people in the UK have, uh, you know, discussions and debates around this. Uh, I feel it's something that we're, we're just going to have to grapple with. Well, you know, it's also something that you, you have to understand that there's a difference between the way that uh, blackness is constructed in America and understood in America and the way it's understood in the UK. Uh, you wouldn't have a situation where, um, you know, Asians or um, other uh, peoples of color, um, for one of another word, uh, you wouldn't have a situation where they would be calling themselves black or that black people would allow them call, to call themselves black because blackness in America is such a loaded term. I mean, it, 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 it's a term where um, in a fashion that no one else in this society has been oppressed. They've been slaves. And because of that, they continue to receive a certain kind of, of a terrible repression because of it. And so they would not allow you know, other people to come and say that they are black, they can express solidarity. And that happened in the 60s. 
uh, with, with various people. Uh, for instance, people that supported the Black Panther Party. You had uh, Asians, a ver variety of Asian groups and others that, that supported uh, the people. In fact, the, the original Rainbow Coalition came from the Black Panther Party in Chicago uh, of various nationalities, including whites. So there, there have been multinational organizations, but they have not um, encapsulated the uh, the broader based community, certainly of Black people. They would not allow it. I know of cases where people have come from other countries that are Black uh, and uh, have been subjected to uh, discrimination or prejudice of, of a sort to prevent them from working with, you know, black people born in America. You know, you got some very narrow nationalists that were, for instance, angry over uh, a role in a movie uh, that was done by a person outside <laughs> outside of the United States, uh, a black person born in Africa or, or the Caribbean or whatever, and they get a movie role of, of a black political figure and they're angry over that i mean they ra raised a uh, campaign over that and to me that is narrow nationalism that's narrow narrow black nationalism and uh, i think the i do tend towards more towards okay um pan-africanism in the sense that i recognize that black people and most of us do have very similar historical experiences and current experiences um can you know identify with each other's uh, condition, no matter where we are in the world, we can do this. And um, I think that one of the one of the times that I really understood that is when uh, I, my case was supported by Australian Aborigines. And of course, I really didn't know anything about Australian Aborigines. I knew there were black people there. I didn't know anything about them, though. And uh, but they supported my case, and uh, I think it was a, a sort of Shakur's case too, because he was in he was in prison at the time. And um, they um, sent me literature and so forth, and it gave me an understanding of what their historical experience had been. Of course, that was one of the, you know they were one of the peoples that became part of the original Black Panther Party. You know, they, they actually sent delegates to uh, to America to meet with the, you know, the leadership of the Black Panther Party. And they gave them go ahead and create an Australia Black Panther Party. And, that's, and they did it with, of course, as you say, seven, seven other countries. Uh, but um, no, you wouldn't have found a situation inside of America where they would have allowed, um, you know, other peoples of color to, they'd been unity, they'd been, there had been, you know, really tight unity, but there would not have been a situation where they would come and actually say that they're black. That wouldn't have been permissible. But, okay, and, you know, I want to uh, quickly move on, because I know we're pressed for time, um, move our conversation to talking about something that we mentioned a little earlier on, with about the portrayal of black power and you know the portrayal not only of the black panther party but the movement at large you know encompassing all of the global movements that were taking place and i wanted to ask you you know obviously this past year with the black lives matter movement which i guess we have to mention um we've seen so many films and tv shows and you know, whatever come about uh, that are celebrating all of the different figures. And we know from what you've said already that you don't like this vanguard approach. You don't like this, you know, appraisal of leadership. Rather, you prefer an appraisal of the people. But I wanted to ask you, you know, what do you make of the mainstream media's embrace of radical politics or radical movements? And do you believe that this is simply a tool of the state to try and control us by using our history against us? Yeah, I'm I'm totally uh, convinced of that. Uh, in very, you know, in most instances, uh, I'll give you an example. I'll actually give you two. Uh, the um, first Black Panther movie, uh, the script for it was written by a actual police and CIA agent, a name Earl Anthony. That's the first movie. I think it came out in 1998, this movie. And um, in it, I mean, the, the government literally controlled how this film was made. 
I mean, to be quite honest. And the way they projected it is that the informer was, um, he, you know, he was uh, someone who was put in a bad position and, and so forth and so on. They, they built this sympathy up for him. And that was the first movie, and it was uh, it was a disgrace. But because so many young people had no knowledge of the Black Panther Party, they had been uh, kept away from even having uh, peripheral knowledge of it. It was seen to be a good thing by some activists. There there were a lot of arguments over that. And then, of course, last year's uh, movie on on uh, Fred Hampton. Uh, who, you know, was, was the chairperson of the Chicago Black and uh, Fred Hampton. And uh, now they, you know, it, he was just seen as being a despicable figure to some extent. But, you know, the fact that they did that, um, to me, puts us back in the framework of how the state uh, controls the narrative of uh, black radicalism. Uh, they make them out to be people who uh, was much more of a realistic portrayal of, 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 of you know, who Fred Hampton and, and the Chicago Panthers were. But um, overall, they put the Panthers in a box almost, FBI did, as the, as the agents of the state and how they use this you know, this person who is supposed to be this poor, uh, you know, person who's being used and made into an informer and made into a provocateur. Well, that uh, cannot be accepted. I, I wrote about it. I, I wrote, I tried to write a series of articles about it and so forth, denouncing people misunderstood, thinking I was attacking the movement, uh, attacking the movie itself. Uh, as um, a, a failed enterprise. And that wasn't what I was doing. I was saying that this is how the state is able to utilize uh, a movie like this and subvert it from what the actual essence was of, of the struggle to this, you know, fanciful, uh, fictional um, ide ideology. You know, people want to, you know, talk about the, uh, uh, the symbolism the symbolism of the Black Panther Party, as opposed to the program. You never hear any of these people talking about what the actual program of the Black Panther Party was, or what the actual program of, of the Black Power Movement was, for that matter. It's always in terms of uh, symbolism and, um, you know, some kind of uh, cultural appropriation, a cultural ideology, I should say, not appropriation, ideology. And, and this is exactly the same with uh, Claudia Jones, who is someone who, you know, I guess we in the UK can't really, you know, claim her as our own. But Claudia Jones, her legacy has been reduced down to the founder of Carnival in London. No, she was a communist who had clear visions of how the state should run, of how, you know, you know, feminism should go, the direction it should go, black liberation, uh, but she's been reduced down to a carnival event. And, um, you know, I think what you're saying is pertinent, but I wanted to ask you. Well, let, but let me ask you this though, let me, before you go, before you ask me this, let me point out to you. Right now, for instance, you are talking about Black Lives Matter. What's happened is the controversy of the Black Lives Matter in the United States is because over, the money that was contributed by the corporations during the 2020 rebellion over the you know George Floyd rebellion and how they used that money to weaken the organization and to subvert the organization uh, the, the state has and you know and, and, and critics as well I'm one of those critics of the, I think that there should be accountability by the leadership of any movement but this is one of the, this is an example of what's happening right now in terms of how the state, you know, not even the state having to do anything, but how the, the capitalist system is able to subvert people. Uh, I mean, to go into the stuff, what they're doing, the leadership and the founders and everything, uh, they've undermined the entire legacy of those organizers, street organizers. But, I, but I, I, I feel this goes further. Like, I'll disagree with you on this point. I feel this goes further than just BLM. You know, when you look at figures. Oh, yeah, it does. 
even like MLK and something that I fear is after you passed this will happen to you you know people will portray you in one way when you were another way with MLK we just had MLK day uh, you know pass you know everyone gets their flags and they get their articles and they get their whatever and they celebrate MLK in the UK it's happened to uh, you know darker Sal, who you know and now he's become a national hero and people praise him and they celebrate him in a way that he wasn't celebrated when he was here. And I just think that this is a cultural thing that we need to actually grapple with. How do we celebrate and reconcile with our history in a way that doesn't actually damage the history and the achievements that were made before? And that leads me on to my question. How do we protect our history? How do we celebrate it in a way that doesn't actually damage from what was achieved? Well, I think it's important that we understand that <clears throat> we have a responsibility to teach the history and to teach the ideology and so forth, uh, uh, you know, of, of movements past, uh, present, and, and otherwise, you know. And, um, you know, me as an individual, you know, <clears throat> I never tell anyone to worship me or to claim that I was a, a perfect person, uh, you know, at all. I mean, I, 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 I say don't worship anyone and you can respect the work that people did. I, I think it's always been this problem of, um, you know, cult of personality it has always been a problem. It's weakened the black movement. It has weakened it for years. Uh, you know, the fact some people talk about Huey P. Newton uh, as, as a, well, some people who are in the party might talk about him as a villain, but, uh, but the fact that a large part of a segment of a society, especially black, black society, uh, either worship the Black Panther Party blindly, not knowing anything about it, not knowing anything about its, its programs, or uh, that they, um, would um, denounce them as you know in 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 accordance with what the government says because the government has always denounced them, but they're smart enough. The government smart enough to know that they can't continually denounce them and destroy their legacy. They have to allow some truths to be told about what they did, but they can weaken it by claiming some kind of um, you know personality cultism of the leaders. That's why I said I don't concentrate on leaders of a movement, I concentrate on the rank and file. What did the rank and file do? And what were the aspirations of the rank and file? And, and, so, and that's really the important thing. That, that really is something that you hear the old, the old Panthers talking about that now all the time, talking about what the rank and file did. And there's all these disagreements about the leaders and so forth. And there's the same disagreements, I contend, uh, within the Black Power Movement. You know, there, there are people, yes, you got people that, that recognize, you know, Stokely Carmichael and so forth. Uh, but there are also a considerable number of people who don't and who recognize the, you know, they, they recognize that he did some things, but it was the movement which was more important than the uh, individuals, you know. And Black Power came about inside of SNCC in a number of different ways. It didn't just come from Silk and Carmichael. Uh, it, it actually was put forth by, in 1965, inside of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee uh, as a proposal. And it didn't actually bear root until a year or so later. You know what I'm saying? And um, then that was also around the time when there was also these debates inside of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee with uh, John Lewis, for instance, who had been one of the leaders, early leaders of, the, of, the, of SNCC. And he was drummed out of the organization. Ultimately, the whites that were in the organization, it, continued in there to some time, 65, 64, they were driven out of the organization all in mass. And uh, so it changed its focus to a black power organization. And then ultimately it, it linked up and united with the Black Panther Party, like I was saying, you know, at, at the eight, later stages of the 60s. But those those are things that not that are not talked about because people want to remember or or they want to be told comfortable uh, untruths 
they'd rather be told comfortable untruths rather than be told the truth uh, about what shaped you know in in those periods and how what we can draw from them. Because my thing is to be able to draw from something uh, which was valuable, but reject the rest or put it within context. Put it within context. <clears throat> And so that's where I'm coming from with that. And that's the way I write. That's the way I write. But then, but then to ask you a question, you know, looking at yourself personally, do you ever feel, you know, obviously here in the UK, you know, we're seeing your name, your books are being sold, they're doing well. Do you ever feel a personal conflict where your name is being uplifted and your book is being uplifted and you are being raised as now, you know, this kind of, you know, icon of the anarchist movement, which I know, you know, it might not be something that you, you know, aspired to or wanted, but it's happened because your book is being republished over and over again. It's resonating with people. Do you ever feel a personal conflict that you're now becoming something that you worked against, that you never wanted to be this icon? Well, I, people will tell you that. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, I don't, I don't believe I'm some so-called icon now. Uh, that that's a great surprise to me, uh, because I've been a uh, underground figure uh, for so long. I mean, to be quite honest, and and that has been intentional uh, to a large part. I've not sought uh, some kind of uh, celebrity status, and uh, so if it's happening now, it'd be you know, something I, 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 I'm not happy about. But I will say this, you know, my, my intention is to spread my ideas uh, to as many people as I can. That's why I was thrilled that uh, Pluto Press picked up on the book. I mean, because all the other occasions, it's been some small collective of anarchists that have done it. And, uh, you know, there's been some periods of time when I couldn't get it published at all. So um, because of, you know, conflict, People didn't like me or some, some class of people didn't like me and they would block me from getting uh, any recognition with the book and so forth. But it, the book itself has lasted because it deals with a number of things, including ideological uh, conflicts, but ideological principles of anarchism. And so from that standpoint, it's important. Now, we're talking about a different movement that I'm part of, that I'm becoming, became part of, because the anarchism of the, the white radicals and so forth, so all of that, uh, and and what the popular imagination is that these young people are just breaking glass in the window and this, that, and other. I'm talking about a different kind of movement. I'm talking about a movement that is based in black communities. I'm talking about a movement that is um, a revolutionary force um, that that represents the 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 poorest elements or segments of society. And I, so I'm talking about a different kind of movement that has a, a, a perspective and understanding that, for instance, you know, when we talk about white radicals talk about fascism, I've disagreed with them, uh, Antifa and the rest of them for years. But my thing is, I understand that we're facing, we're always facing genocide in the United States, not just the United States, but you know, in the United States for sure. That's what we're facing, genocide. And uh, so I have a perspective on anarchism, a perspective on radicalism and all that. Whatever I do, whatever it is, is going to be based on the condition of Black people, the oppression of Black people. And um, now we're talking about Black people, in the, you know, not just the United States, we're talking about all over the world. That was the point I made. I, I am an internationalist. But it's an internationalist that uh, understands that oppressed peoples, and especially oppressed Black people who are always at the bottom in every country in the world, um, even with the so-called uh, African states where you got puppet regimes that represent Europe more than they represent Africa. Um, so that's, where I'm, I'm, that's what I'm saying. I, I, I am subverting even the movement that I became part of, anarchism. I, I've subverted it to deal with building a black radical, a black anarchist movement. Um, and this process has started, I'm not gonna be able to finish it of course, but to start the process, to, to put the formative ideas out there 
in anarchism and the black revolution, that's important to me. Uh, I don't think I'll be remembered as some celebrity, even if I fall out, fell out dead tomorrow. But I've also take, make, <laughs> taken a, taken a um, I'm creating an institute that will protect my writing and, and you know, and so forth uh, with, with one of my uh, good, good friends and allies who actually helped me get the book published this uh, last time anyway. Uh, I, w I, I will say, you know, celebrity is temporary, pioneer is permanent, and that's what you are. But with, with that aside, with that aside, I I will uh, you know try and build on what you said there. You know, talking about optimism. You know, talking about the future. You're someone who you know for over forty years you've been fighting for this. You've been teaching people about this ideology. You've been trying to get closer to black liberation, liberation for you know humanity as a whole. You know, forty years is a long time. And when you look at, you know, I'll speak selfishly. When I when I look at that and I look at other activists, you know, I admire what you do, but I have, you know, pessimism, you know, running through me where I'm like, will this ever happen? And what I want to ask you is how do you maintain optimism and how do activists, you know, your advice to activists, how do you maintain optimism? in the face of struggle? Well, I look at the long view of history. Uh, I don't look at it in terms of just what's happening right now. And what's happening right now means that this is the status quo and it, and it can be changed. Um, in point of fact, you know, we're actually, if, if, if what you're saying is that people are buying the book and people are interested in what I'm saying and see, to reach people with what I'm saying, and I'm saying the same thing consistently. Um, but yes, uh, the long view of history understands that movements come along and, and activists become part of the movements. But after a while that many become pessimistic or many take their place in conventional society. You see what I'm saying? And, and there's the question of what I, I call transformation and radicalization. Now, radicalization is during the radical stage of the 1960s, for instance, with the Black Power Movement. You had people that were in it, but then after the movement died or it was defeated, then they went, you might find them as a college professor. You might find them as a doctor, lawyer. You might find them in, in the conservative movement. We don't know. We, we've seen all of that. And But then there are others, and I'm one of those people. I'm one of those people. I have been transformed from being the kind of person who cares about what's happening in conventional society, and but always my casket. I won't be in Hollywood signing uh, signing books uh, or 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 making performances or some movie. Uh, I'll be the same person. And it's good that the ideas have gotten popular and, and so forth. But what's more important to me is to be able to uh, look at the, the long view of history, make my contribution, and then give the facts to people, give the, the, the methods of struggle to people, and then I've played my role. And that's all I'm interested in. I'm not interested in adulation. Or, or someone naming their kid after me or, or, or naming a street after me and all that. I'm not interested in that. Um, and I'm sure, you know, Malcolm X wasn't either, but the reality is that people pick up on you. I don't think that's going to happen in my case. I think that there's going to be uh, some respect, I hope, uh, for what I've done. But, you know, that's even debatable because I've had people try to write me out of any anarchist history at all, you know, for, for political reasons and so forth. And so... Um, I think that uh, the whole idea for me is that we uh, see what I've done or, or as being part, just making a, my part of a struggle that's gone on before, even before I got here. One point that I definitely want to come across before we uh, conclude the interview is the point about Pan-Africanism. Now you write, intercommunalism, 
the idea of the Black Panther Party is contrasted to Pan-Africanism that is supposed to recognize all Africans as being part of the diaspora. You put, but not recognize the contradictions of neo-colonialism that is corrupt dis dictators like Haile Selassie, German Kenyatta, Tom Boyer are uh, held up as legitimate leaders. And uh, you go on to say, we cannot unite with any government, rather with the masses of the oppressed people themselves. Now, building on that, as someone who, you know, for so long, I, you know, held myself up as being a Pan-Africanist and, you know, until reading your book, I must say, you know, held myself up as being a Pan-Africanist and said, you know, I believe in Pan-Africanist ideas, but reading your book and reading your opposition to political parties, reading your opposition to, you know, these post-colonial leaders, I wanted to ask you practically, how do we create this, these, um, you know, links of solidarity between the working class in the West and the working class in the global South? And, you know, I know, I know that you write here that, you know, we must build autonomous movements of people based on anarchist principles. But I will say that for me, that seemed like a long-term goal. It's not a short-term goal. You know, that's something that's gonna take, you know, the West building their own, you know, movements around uh, the anarchist movement and uh, also in the global South. So how do we practically link up these people when, you know, the situation is pretty dire right now? Well, <clears throat> let me say this, that um, I am a um, practical anarchist because I am a uh, organizer on the grassroots level. I believe in organizing on the grassroots level. I don't think we can get out of this stage of capitalism and build a new society unless we do recognize that we have to organize uh, in communities themselves. We have to, to recognize that the class issues that are in black communities are the same kinds of class issues in many respects that uh, reared us head back in, back in the day it, it, with the Black Panther Party. They were, the difference they made is that they believed in organizing in communities for power. It's just that you know, as I said, there's this discrepancy between who would, would, would exercise power. Would the leadership or would the would, would Vanguard Party exercise it or would the masses of people exercise it? So uh, for me, I, I, I look at these issues and I don't claim to have all the answers, but I will have some answers. And one of those answers is that anarchists, I've been saying this for years and none of the, you know, most of the anarchist movement has not listened to me. That's why I was just saying that uh, to hear now that somehow I'm, uh, the book is some kind of icon or, or whatever. <clears throat> For the most part, none of these anarchists have listened to me at all and uh, continue to just organize in terms of, of activism. I'm not trying to organize in terms of just activism. I'm trying to organize in terms of power in the hands of the mass of people, grassroots uh, power. And um, that's an important stage and a different stage from uh, most of the anarchists. Most of the anarchists are not following behind Lorenzo and doing what I'm saying. You know, I haven't seen that happen uh, in, ever. But um, I will say that there have been some people, you know, in the anarchist movement, black and white and otherwise, uh, that have, you know, given respect to what I'm writing at least because I'm also writing about uh, and, and placing anarchist politics and history within context. Uh, but no, I think that we need a practical method of organizing, whatever you call it, if it was anarchism or whatever it is, we need a practical method of organizing communities, not just uh, stating sterile theories and so forth and so on, but base it on actual material conditions and movements that have gone before even. I'm not saying I'm emulating the Black Panther Party. I've never believed in this whole idea of starting a new Black Panther Party. I've never believed in that. One is the material conditions that created the original Black Panther Party no longer exists exactly like that. You know, the civil rights movement had a lot to do with the rise of Black power and the Black Panther Party. And uh, so all these attempts to create a Black Panther Party, let me just say that there have been 25 attempts 
that I know of the, to create the Black Panther, to create another Black Panther Party, and they've all failed dismally. And um, so I think, you know, we can take, um, I, I have respect for what the party did, it, its programs and so forth, uh, more than I do personalities. I'm not concerned with personalities, to be quite honest. Uh, I think that the, some of the programs and the organizers, the things that the organizers did, how they reached the community and how they politically educated people and how they used the Black Panther newspaper, those things still resonate with me today and resonate with a number of activists, including my wife, who, who was one of the editors of the Black Panther newspaper. Um, so that's important. But no, there is no... Uh, just the belief in an idea alone, and somehow people are going to get free. It isn't a question of that. It has to be linked to the actual material conditions that people are suffering from, or suffering under at that moment, or, or, or in, in, in fact, in terms of the, as a classlet, how, how black people are suffering under this system uh, in the United States. I don't, I can't speak as a, you know, for the UK, but certainly uh, there are similar elements of oppression there. And um, so whatever we do, it has to be practical. It has to be based on the material conditions that people suffer under. And we have to ideologically uh, educate people and make them become part of the radical process. But I, I, I feel, yeah, and I completely agree with what you're saying. I feel when we talk about, you know, Africa, you know, obviously in our uh, talk about Pan-Africanism, the point where I feel a bit more reserved is where we talk about, you know, obviously we want to root everything in the grassroots and I completely agree with you on that point. But when you talk about the grassroots activists in Africa, you know, not the people that get the fame or the accolades, but the grassroots who are really doing the work, they're people who don't necessarily get uh, or have the resources or the connections to, you know, link themselves with, movements in the West. And I feel sometimes that we have to think in a new way of how are we gonna you know, connect you know, the grassroots, you know, the working class in the West, you know, the people who are disaffected over here versus the people uh, you know, in the global South. How are we you know, gonna actually get them to connect? And uh, I feel the reason why we're at the stage we are today is because it's so much easier for the middle class of the West and the middle class of the global South to connect. You know, they have access to digital technology, to financial resources, to, you know, networking resources. Um, but when we're talking about the grassroots, the real grassroots, how are we actually going to get them to connect? That's, that's just what plays in my mind sometimes. Well, you know, we have to also understand that they they are seeing what's happening all over the world as well. I mean, you know, even the people at, on the bottom of a radio or a TV or whatever. So they know about things that are happening in the world. Sometimes you find out they know more about it than the people in the West that are brainwashed and, 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 and so jaded that all they care about is, you know, their, te their, 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 their telly or, or they care about their, their phone or whatever, you know, but I get your point. You know, and here's the thing I say to you, you know, um, you know, we can't come, we, we can't really compare uh, the poor in, in, in the United States, for instance, with the poor in, in, um, in South Africa. We can't really do that because there's a, a, a term called, uh, it was explained to me a long time ago called relative deprivation and in the united if you if you attempted to compare the condition of, of let's say uh, poor people in the united states well they'll have more resources even though they're poor they'll they'll have more resources than than someone who who is in 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 the in in, in a part of the third world or you know um what we what used to be called third world it's, it's different now in an you know in an underdeveloped country and um but, but, you know, it's like everything else. Uh, you have to reach out. The, the people who are in the so-called West and so forth have to be able to reach out to those who are in, uh, in, in those third world countries or in the, the so-called third world countries. I, I'm, I'm sorry if I keep using that term for my ignorance. I don't know what's being called today, but um, we can reach 
people around the world. That's one of the reasons I talked about it in there. Uh, we need to build a kind of electronic system, whatever you want to call it, that can reach and that can link to communities. That one of the things I was going to create some years ago, I was I was in the process of creating it, was a um, a shortwave radio system uh, that was going to you know uh, have propaganda all over the world. Well, the radio is more potent and is more um, dispersed among all classes of people in in Africa and other, in other parts of the world. The radio is more powerful than than the tally is, you know, and I, I'm, that may be have changed to some extent, but I found that <clears throat> when we were doing Black Liberation Radio in Chattanooga, I have a friend that lives in Nigeria who's also an anarchist and has written a book called Black, called uh, African Anarchism, Sam Mba. Uh, I'm not sure if he's alive now, he might have passed away, whatever. But anyway, he came to visit me and we talked and so forth. And uh, <clears throat> He, he opened a lot of uh, portals in my mind about things like that. You know, we were sending him, <clears throat> we had a campaign, we were sending him parts for a radio station that he could start. He saw me, saw the radio station I had in Chattanooga, my hometown. And um, I had never had any money. I'm not in the middle class. I'm, I'm poor, but it's poor by the standards of this country. Uh, and um, is you know, and it's a different kind of thing. I mean, there isn't actually a peasantry, let's say, in in the United States. Even though there 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 has been uh, one, they tried to claim that there never was, but there has been a peasantry. And um, you know, so I, I I get what you're saying. Uh, there has to be a method to reach uh, the other poor people around the world and radicalize them with ideas and. Um, I think that'll happen. I think that'll happen. And I, and, I, and I always say that I'm always open to make it happen, you know, whether, whether whatever the technology is at a particular moment in history, cell phones and, and what have you. But yeah, most of the groups who've been able to struggle in this period, at least up to this period, have been in the middle class uh, or even upper middle class that's true and that and that makes and that has made a difference but see that always makes a difference that's what i'm saying the people who are on the bottom who don't have anything they are looking for alternatives they're not looking for the next government necessarily they're looking to survive under one exists but they're looking for a permanent solution they're looking to transform their societies completely but if they don't get the access to the ideas then it's much more difficult for them to do it <laughs> and there you have this thing with you know um, the savior complex and and, and of the elements and bef before i let you go uh you know there's one conversation that we've had numerous times over the phone and i feel that it's one that you know we should actually bring to the audience which is a conversation about the way that we treat our older radicals um and this is something that has been weighing on my mind you know we have you know, Black Lives Matter, you know, going global around the world and, you know, raising money for this cause and this cause. But we often forget about the radicals such as yourself who have sacrificed their life to the struggle. And not just you, we have radicals in the UK, radicals in America who are still incarcerated because of right. you know the sacrifices that they made and we've spoken about this but i wanted to ask you in front of my audience you know how can we honor the radicals that have come before us how can we truly look after them or you know create some kind of system where they're looked after in old age after giving so much of their life towards the struggle that so many of us aren't really able to give up or aren't willing to give up well, you know, one of the things uh, that um, my wife, uh, as I said, who was an activist herself, uh, talked about is why we have to uh, support um, elderly activists, you know, and, and, and why we have to have a campaign. And to some extent that's happening, a campaign to get um, political prisoners that are in the 60s and 70s get them out of prison and versus Mumi Abu Jamal. We talk about that all the time, but there are others. And uh, unfortunately they're dying in prison right now. 
they're dying in prison. And those on the street are, are suffering uh, economic problems to a large degree. I'm one of them myself, to be quite honest, have been. I mean, I hope I, I, I got, you know, some funds from the book or whatever, but, you know, it's, it's been very difficult, um, you know, unless you're a professional or something, unless you uh, get some break or something, you know, you, you, you might be able to do better, but uh, it's, it's very difficult for, for radicals like myself who are deemed by the state to be sort of dangerous and, and everything uh, that, and, and nonconformist, especially nonconformist. And uh, so it's very difficult for us to, you know, uh, survive even, you know, less known, um, <clears throat> be able to uh, thrive in some, in some sort of way or get a, a movement that recognizes your contribution and uh, works to create you with material resources. Um, we have talked about that. We, we, you know, talked about it in terms of some kind of institute uh, or, or something of that nature uh, that identifies who these, who these uh, political prisoners or these, these uh, older activists are, uh, makes contact with them and, you know, raises money and, and other resources for them and so forth. And we have not been able to do it ourselves, but it's something that we have to put on the agenda and have a serious discussion. I thank you very much for even raising that as a young, younger activist, but you recognize the necessity for it. And uh, it's a disgrace. It really is a disgrace uh, that you have to beg for money rather than uh, to have some kind of uh, program uh, I, one of the things that the Black Panther Party did, and I'm just, I'm not, you know, romanticizing the Black Panther Party, but one program they had was called SAFE, uh, Seniors Against a Fearful Environment. And one of the things that people would do is take them to cash checks, uh, to buy food and, and, and other things like that, things that they needed to survive with. And although that program does not meet what we're talking about right now, it doesn't meet those needs. Uh, just the idea that that this movement was thinking of that, and we don't have a movement that thinks like that now, that that incorporates that kind of uh, concern for for seniors or whatever in, in in their program. They don't have it, and 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 I, I contend that there's really not a revolutionary alternative in this period at all. You know, not not that's mature enough to to build a mass based movement. I'll put it like that. You know, I know this is Black Lives Matter, but it's not a revolutionary movement in my mind. It's a civil rights movement. And uh, <clears throat> so I think that uh, until, and I thank you again for even raising it, but uh, until the younger activists and the communities and, and so forth understand the value of the work that went on um, to win some of the victories that they even have now, you know, understand a lot of things that people have, or Black people even have, you know, is because of activists. They'll talk about Dr. King or this, that, and other, but Dr. King wasn't even a part of the later civil rights period. You know, he wasn't even, he didn't lead the movements from 1960 onward. That was a movement led by youth. And then that movement uh, created the Black Power Movement or the created the conditions for the Black Power Movement. So, um, yeah, we have to pressure the left and the so-called radicals and the others in this period and the black community. We have to pressure the black community as well or educate. Sometimes when I say pressure, people get the wrong idea. You pressure the enemy, you ideologically educate your community. But yeah, that, that has to happen. To finish off uh, our conversation, I wanted to run through a quick fire round of questions that I always have with my audience. And uh, I invite you to fill in uh, the rest of my sentence. So the first one, the biggest misconception about me is? Well, the biggest misconception is that I'm a, <clears throat> a violent person uh, when uh, in point of fact, I'm just a, an ordinary uh, human being who has been uh, pushed into situations because of the oppression uh, upon uh, my people and and uh and upon the poor in this in the uh united states that's the biggest okay. misconception second one my biggest regret is mm. 
I suppose, you know, I, I could have lived a different kind of life. I don't, you don't, you don't regret what you ever missed, but I could have lived a different kind of life. And I could have done that at different stages after I got out of prison, for instance. Uh, one of my uh, uh, persons that worked with me when I was in prison got out and became an attorney in uh, Baltimore. And um, he knew that I had uh, done, I was a jailhouse lawyer, if you will, uh, inside the prison inmate paralegal. He knew this and uh, he wanted me to consider uh, letting him help me to become an, an attorney in, 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 uh, in Maryland. And uh, <clears throat> I was so entrenched in the struggle in my hometown against racism and police brutality that I just couldn't pull myself away from it. Uh, to some extent, I regret that I didn't do that. Uh, I regret that I didn't, you know, I could have been living a different kind of life. I certainly not had the economic struggles if I had taken him up on his offer. But there again, um, you can't really miss the thing that you never had, you know. It was an opportunity, but I, I just felt like what I was doing was more important to me uh, in shaping my hometown, getting rid of uh, police terrorism, getting rid of uh, the kind of uh, violent racism by the Ku Klux Klan and other organizations. That was more important to me than uh, going on to law school, which I'd have been successful at, I, quite honestly, I'd been just as successful, if not more so than he was. I'm most proud of. Well, I'm most proud of the fact that um, I've remained uh, consistent. I remain out of the hands of the state um, in terms of them subverting me or, or killing me or putting me in prison again. And um, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that they didn't break me. They didn't break me uh, culturally. They didn't break me uh, certainly psychologically or um, emotionally. They, they just didn't break me. They didn't break my spirit. And um, no matter how much suffering I've done since or uh, that time or what I suffered in, pr in prison, um, I'm still, I've got the same uh, logic, lofty, you can say lofty logic or whatever, but I have the same beliefs. I believe that it is possible to have a revolution uh, in the country and in the world. And uh, so my writings and everything I've done and do is related to that, that belief. To me, freedom means. Well, to me, that, well, well, first of all, let me say this. Freedom doesn't mean that, that, that you're just free to do anything you want to. Freedom means building a new society. And freedom means uh, bringing an end to oppression of, of any sort, but especially uh, oppression of, you know, racial oppression and, uh, and the oppression of, of one class over another, you know, and, uh, so I, I'm in favor of a new society. I, I call myself a uh, libertarian or anarchist socialist. Some people call it that. Uh, and, and the reason I call myself that because I have an idea about the kind of society I wanna have. I wanna have a society that there, there is not nation state war. There is not prisons and, and cops that dominate society. There is not one class which, which rules over another or rules over society as a whole, the rich class. And, um, and, 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 that, and that's the, the start of the kind of society that I want to build. So my, my perspective is not in terms of some uh, high in the, pie in the sky or something that's unattainable, but you know, if we can build a strong enough movement, we can make these things happen. And finally, I want to be remembered for well, I want to be remembered for a lifelong revolutionary, a lifelong activist. Uh, if we started when I was in prison, uh, you know, well, before I was in prison, even <laughs> I was an activist, you know, in my hometown as a youth. And uh, then I went into the military, I, you know, drafted to the military. I was against the Vietnam War. I organized people in the, in the uh, military not to go to Vietnam when they were trying to uh, force force uh, thousands of, of soldiers to go to Vietnam. Um, I, um, you know, and I, I, when I got out of prison, I was like, I acted, uh, worked as a anti-draft organizer to, to stop black people from going into the army or make them understand that they didn't have to go. They, they, you know, they didn't have to be subjected to the kind of uh, 
uh, controls and, and, and you know, make, be, become a uh, cannon fodder for the American government. And also one of the, you know, political education about the racist nature of the war. They didn't have any stake in fighting that war at all. And uh, so after I did that, then of course, went in briefly into the Black Panther Party and then became a revolutionary organizer, politically educated, and went in, you know, went, went to prison uh, ultimately. And when I got in prison, I uh, became a revolutionary organizer inside the prisons, became one of the leaders of the prison movement. And, um, you know, and then uh, got out of prison, came home and started working um, in the South, in my hometown first, um, against the Ku Klux Klan, or a, a white racist, fascist organization, and organizing against police terrorism. My, my hometown at one point was the number one city in the United States for um, you know cities of less than 100,000 people for, for police killings. It was the number one city. Uh, and uh, so I, I, I led a campaign, uh, you know, it was one of the leaders of a campaign of a movement called the Concerned Citizens for Justice and we fought police terrorism for 15 years, you know, there in my hometown. And um, so, I mean, you know, we did a great number of things, a great number of things to uh, bring an end to injustice and terrorism. And that's what I'm most proud of, actually, you know, that, that doing all that work. Lorenzo Camboa Irvin, thank you for joining me on Telefriend. Thank you. Thank you for having me, brother, very much. Mm -hmm.